Oh, I got some good news for you. So, on Apple now. And this is going on YouTube tomorrow. I was going to just put it on uh, Spotify like I always do, but I think I'm going to just have a still frame. I'm um, a still frame. Yeah, just basically a still picture and just run the audio under it until we get the video done. So, this will be the first, you know, right. first official YouTube video of the podcast. It is All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so here we are talking about the Batman. I am not alone. Like I said, I was going to have my buddy Will come over, Wolfpack. Like, yeah, it's about, it's about damn time. We took way too much time to get back together and do anything. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to get all three of us back in here. I'm going to have to drag <laughs> drag Marcus out of the house and get his ass <laughs> over here so we can do this the right way, all three of us getting together. But get either him, way. Get him, get him away from that do say. Yeah, get Oh, Lord. I'm I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how y'all drink that shit. I, I, I can't do it. I just, I, I'm going to stick to my whiskey and my moonshine. I'm gonna stick, to what, <laughs> stick to what I know. Stick to what I like. Anyway. But um, so glad to be. So glad you're here. So glad we can talk about the Batman. Because this movie, uh, you know me. I had my reservations from the time they announced it. Number one, it's another Batman movie. And I have always said we need to get away from doing Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and, Flat and all them. Like, we need to branch out. I had my reservations about Robert Pattinson. I yeah, was like, yeah. oh, God. The mercy. outfit he had on? Uh, with that, <laughs> I mean, before the outfit on the red carpet, I, before the outfit on the red carpet, and I said this, I was like, okay. I waffled back and forth. I said, okay, this may be good. It might be good. I don't know. I'm going to give it a shot. And then he had the outfit on the red carpet, and I was like, uh, His stylist need to be fired. Yeah, his stylist <laughs> need to be fired because he came out there in his daddy suit. Headed to court for the first time. You know how that look goes. <laughs> um, but with that being said, I was wrong at the same time I was right. I was right that he played uh, the Bruce Wayne version of, uh, the, of what Robert Pattinson was doing was not that good. But with that being said, like I said in the episode for Friday, his version of um, Bruce Wayne was the perfect version for this tone of a movie. This is a broken Bruce Wayne. This is a man who has nothing. He doesn't want any ties to the to the Wayne family. He only wants to be Batman. And as far as Robert Pant, uh, Robert Pattinson playing Batman and being in the suit, God damn, he was good. I got to give it up. I was so damn wrong about that. I'm, I'm gonna say something a little bit later about that about the uh, the contrast between the Batman that he played and the version of Bruce Wayne that he played. I got something I want to say about that. Okay. Later. Um. I was happy. By the time this movie was over, I was like, okay, this is not Michael Keaton. This is not Val Kilmer. This is not George Clooney. This isn't Christian Bale. The hell, this isn't even uh, Kevin Conroy from the animated version. Adam West. Yeah, 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 definitely not Adam West. <laughs> this is a different version, a different tone of Batman slash Bruce Wayne. And he played both of them damn near perfectly. And I was so happy about that because like i said i had my reservations but i said going into this before we went to see it i said look if he plays just a horrible bruce wayne even if the batman is spot on it's going to make me not like the movie because you need to have both of those characters down but he actually pulled off both of those characters he the bruce wayne that he's playing like i said is broken he like he, he told alfred point blank i don't give a shit about you know, I don't give a shit about my name. I don't give a shit about the Wayne legacy. None of that. I don't, I don't even care if I die. Yeah, I don't even care if I die. I don't even That's care about saying. the company. None of that. Uh, this is what I'm doing. This is all I got. This is what I am. And if I'm not doing this, then the hell with it all. Then it's not working. Then it's not working. That was perfect. That was pitch perfect. That's why you don't see any. You don't see him as Bruce Wayne, but a handful of times in the movie. You know, at the funeral when he's running home to check on Alfred after the bomb goes off, this, that, and the other. Um, All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in there now. Okay. I think this is a perfect time for me to say this. The reason why I was 
not that excited about his Bruce Wayne until I actually seen the movie for the second time. Now, this for the second time. I've seen the movie twice. Okay. So the second time is when it dawned on me. Right. The movie only spanned seven days. Yeah. It began on October 31st, and by the time the culmination had come to an end, mm -hmm. it was only uh, November 6th. So he didn't have time to be Bruce Wayne. He was Batman searching for a killer. There was no need for Bruce Wayne at that point. It's only seven days. And I can understand if the movie lasted a year, like uh, like a long Halloween, then he had time to put on the Bruce Wayne mask. But he didn't have time to put on the Bruce Wayne mask. And I and honestly, I think that's that's good. I think Matt Reeves and uh, I forget the other gentleman's name who who uh, co-wrote the script with Matt Reeves, the director. I think that was a good call. Let's keep the time span for this whole plan that Riller has set in motion. Let's keep it short. Let's keep it concentrated on Batman trying to stop the villain. Let's not add on and complicate this film with trying to make Bruce Wayne into this, you know, overarching figure which draws attention away from Batman. Let's not even worry about it. And that fits the storylines that they took this from. This is this movie is not just one storyline. This is part Long Halloween. This is part Batman Zero. This is um, what is it? Uh, Court of Owls. They, they threw some of that in there. This is Batman year one, Batman year two. Um, it's about seven or eight different Batman stories from throughout the years that they've taken parts from. Even a bit of No Man's Land. Yeah, 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 big time. Um, uh, I think that was, uh, yeah, was No Man's Land was from, I want to say Batman Zero or Batman Earth One is one or the other. I want to say it was Batman Zero where the Riddler in that storyline, the Riddler floods Gotham. That was his whole plan, and he actually floods Gotham, which is where you get No Man's Land. Got, uh, Arkham Asylum becomes an island instead of, you know, uh, the the prison you slash... Bane and Joker running around, yeah. which that's another thing I wanted to say. Um, you get shades of um, of uh, Venom yeah. in this movie. And that's exactly what I thought it was. When he did it, I was like, what? I was like, I know yeah, he didn't I just... think they he, just set up Bane. That was one of the Easter eggs that I loved. It was so... Okay, so let me as far as Easter egg, <laughs> as far as Easter eggs go, let's 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 knock a bunch of them out of the way. So number one, like you said, that venom. So when he jabbed himself with it, I was like, they made specific reason and they made a concerted effort to get a close up before that, he jabs himself. That it was with actually it. green. That it was actually green, and I was like, you didn't do that by <laughs> accident. There's no way in hell you did that specifically to show us that it's green. And when he jumps up. Like it gives him not only extra strength, but it enhanced anger. Enhanced anger, just like Bane goes through when he injects venom. So maybe this is like something that he came up with for just such an occasion. And later on, in however many movies they run with Matt Reeves as the director, because they need to keep Matt Reeves as a director to keep this tone. Yeah, they really do. Because right now, this is unlike any other Batman that's been out there. Uh, a lot of people try to make comparisons: which one is better, which one is worse, and really, you can't because. Every iteration of Batman has been so different. So it's just mm -hmm. a matter of which one you like the most. You know, uh, but this one right here, it's it's like walking the fine line between the uh the, the Nolan series. You know, it's uh, it's right along that that groove right there. It's been yeah. it's that dark tone to it. Yeah. It's and they really do need to keep uh, Reeves on for a, a little while longer. Yeah. So, I, and but I, what I've heard, they're actually setting up for this to be a trilogy. Okay. And they got a couple spin offs, uh, Penguin being one. Mm -hmm. not, not sure what the other one is. Gotham. Okay. They're actually doing a Gotham series and the Penguin. The Penguin series didn't get greenlit until the until that Sunday after the movie release. I mean, because come on. Colin, Colin Farrell? Farrell? <laughs> Bruh, look. <laughs> Colin Farrell might. Started. Colin Farrell outside of uh, Paul Dano as the Riddler. Colin Farrell is the most interesting villain in this entire movie. You have Paul Dano as the Riddler. You have Colin Farrell as. Uh, as the Penguin, you have John Turturro, fabulous, fabulous fucking performance as Carmine Falcone. You wind up with the Joker at the end. That's mm -hmm. that's Barry Keegan, and I got a feeling, I think if they do a trilogy, which I don't think they're going to stop at a trilogy, I honestly think it's going to be a quadrilogy. Mm. It's going to be four movies at the very least. And I think the fourth movie will have Barry Keegan as, as the Joker. If they go that route, I think they probably You think they're going to wait that long to, to reveal him? Yeah, because you can run the second, the next movie you can run um, uh, a basically a, a spin off of this into a second movie of him trying to take down the penguin. The penguin's now the big gangster in the in the 
What's next? So, I mean, maybe they skip that one and do it as a trilogy and Joker becomes the third one because, I, like I said, the Penguin is getting his own show on HBO Max. Um, so, who knows? Uh, you bring Catwoman back in. You can... It, it's a handful of villains you can bring back in. As long as we keep Matt Reeves on there, I think yeah. we're going to be... Yeah, um, absolutely. Up, I think we're going to be in, in for quite a surprise of what this guy is capable of doing. Yeah, um, so, yeah, you can... I'm still saying four Because Matt, Matt Reeves himself was an understudy of uh, Jeff Loeb. Jeff, Jeff Loeb, yeah. And I think that's why so many of Jeff Loeb's stories from the comics made its way into this movie. Because most of the... This movie is almost... I would say I would say it's 75 to 90% the long Halloween. Just, you know, truncated. It was, just yeah, there was so much in there. The, the tone of it was long Halloween. The fact that Selena it, is... The fact that it began on Halloween. Halloween not, yeah, you know yeah. The, the fact that Selena is Carmine Falcone's daughter. That's directly out of the, the whole fight between them two. That's directly out of the long Halloween. Um, yeah, Matt Reeves, he, when they sat down and wrote this, he had a vision from Jump Street, and they executed it, which I'm very glad they did. Um, what was one of the other uh, ones that I love? Uh, Hush. I love the fact that they, they put Hush in this. Um, I, I like the fact that, that, that Hush was basically a reporter first, <laughs> sort of, but they hushed him, quote-unquote, and they, they <laughs> flashed the name everywhere. Um I, I love the I love the Easter egg for um, Jim Carrey's version of the Riddler in this. So what? okay, so Paul Dano's Riddler is you know this guy who uh, has been beat down by society, forgotten by society as a whole. Uh, here he is, you know, after all these years, he realizes that the uh, the the fund set up to protect people like him as an orphan and this that and the other is the uh, same fund. Renewal, yeah, renewal. This this renewal fund is. Um, is basically the the source of corruption. The source of corruption. corruption all the way throughout the city. All these so, uh, billionaires getting richer off the poor, uh, off the backs of poor people. Yep, exactly. Which is it, which is true to life. Which is scary. Um, but if you notice, he's wearing glasses. Those exact same glasses that Paul Dano was wearing as the Riddler are the exact same ones that um, uh, Jim Carrey wore as Edward Nigma back in the day in that uh, in that and when he played the Riddler in the movie. These are the exact same glasses. I, I didn't believe it. Somebody had mentioned it to me. I was like, those they, they do kind of look the same. I got to go check. Sure as shit. Side by side comparison. These are exact. I mean, frames, lenses, and all. Mm. Even the crack oh, wow. across the across that uh, lens that uh, that um, Jim Carrey had uh, right after the accident. Remember, right after the accident that gave him the the ability to the overthought this and the other that turned him into the Riddler from the machine. This and the other. Um, when he got caught in the machine, it. It, they cracked his glasses to make it seem like his men, his men, mental state cracked. Paul Dano has the exact same crack in the, in the exact same lens. Yeah, yeah I, saying they, they actually use the same glasses. They, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> probably. I mean, because I mean, because think about it, when they shoot movies and you have props and that and the other, they don't give those props off. They just keep the props. They just put them away. And then usually, if the movie's big and it's like important to um, whoever, they like put it in the museum. This that and the other. So yeah, it could be the exact same glasses that. Jim Carrey actually wore, but for sure, shit. Same frame, same lenses, this, that, and the other. Um, what else is the other one? I'm trying to think of some more Easter eggs that I saw. Uh, the Batmobile uh, uh, in this one. I got a huge Easter egg. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you to get to it, though. Yeah, the, uh, the uh, Batmobile in this one is more reminiscent of the Tumblr than any of the other Batmobiles. Oh, my God, I love the Batmobile love, in this. The Batmobile in this one more than any other Batmobile, including Yo, the Tumblr. I want that one in my garage. That's all I'm saying. This Batmobile scared the shit out of me. <laughs> this is literally like a car where if I'm driving down Camaro? the street. Camaro? I don't know what it was. <laughs> it, 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 it sort of looked like an old Challenger that he had chopped in order to get that jet engine in the back. Yeah, and the little bat wings on the back or something. I don't yeah, know what it was. I don't know what it was. But uh, yeah, I like the bat wings on the back. It's reminiscent of the Michael Keaton Batmobile. Um, I like the fact that it's a uh, homemade car right like he cobbled this together yeah. he doesn't know much about mechanics and other he it's it's bulletproof if, if nothing else but that's yeah. pretty much it if, even when you see him and because that wasn't that wasn't the quote-unquote the bat cave it was uh well, i forgot what they called it but it, it was, was like the, a, a, it was the wayne, station yeah it was the wayne is the wayne terminus Term, of yeah. uh, of an abandoned subway station yeah so here they're no longer in the manor they're, they're not in wayne manor wayne manor much like uh the end of the Nolan series. So remember at the end of the Nolan series, uh, Bruce Wayne is now supposedly dead. Um, they donated his house to become an orphanage. 
right? So in this movie, in the Batman, they are no longer living in Wayne Manor. It's already been it's donated. already been donated as an orphanage mm-hmm. that has now been closed. Yes, right. Um, now it's completely gone. Uh, like I said, that's right out of the comic book. A couple of those out of comic books. So now he's living in Wayne Tower in the penthouse, right? Which is at the center of the city, which is odd, but it is what it is. That that makes all the sense in the world if you think about it. Um, which one did you have? Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have some in my head. I'm trying to think. Yeah, when my man was like. I hope they all die. Um, they didn't help me when my daughter was sick. Uh, don't I know you from somewhere? Oh, Joe Chill. Oh, my goodness. Joe Chill, yeah. When, yo, so the first time I seen the movie, I didn't really peep that. I was like, okay, there's just some stranger in the crowd. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I was so excited about the movie. It was it had already jumped off to a good start, so I was already pulled into it. So I'm just watching the action as it unfolds. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until the second time that I actually seen the movie, and when the guy... And I was looking for like I was looking for stuff at that point. So when the guy came up and was like, um, you know, I, I hope they all die. They're all corrupt, and you know they didn't help me when my daughter was sick. You know, and then he turned and looked at Bruce and he said, "Don't I know you from somewhere?" And I was saying, "I got a feeling." The next thing I know, Bruce is walking away, but he's looking at him, and then this guy just starts moving backwards toward the shadows until he's completely covered in shadow. I said, that was Joe Chill. And I, I didn't think about that until after you told me. So we went and saw it together the first time. I went and saw it. You went and saw it the Tuesday after. I went and saw it uh, the Wednesday after. Um, when you had told me that, I was like, I didn't even notice that. So I was, I was specifically looking for when they got to uh, this this mayor funeral. I was like, okay, let me watch this guy and see what it is. Sure as shit. He basically fades into the background, almost like you know, some similar to reminiscent of the way the uh, the Jack character, who's supposed to be the one that turns into the Joker from the Michael Keaton one, he fades out in that exact same one. I was like, "Holy shit!" Mm-hmm. I was like, "You're right. This is supposed to be Joe Chill." And then you just stuck him in there just out of nowhere, like yeah. like nothing's popping. I was like, "Oh my then god!" On, on top of that, later on, without using his name, Falcone mentions him. Yeah. When he says that, I don't know if it was just some random drophead or if it was uh, Salvatore Moroni who killed your parents. Mm-hmm. He was speaking of Chill because it was um, probably more than likely Falcone himself who had hired Joe Chill. Mm-hmm. That's why he knew that it was a random drophead. Which is, uh, them throwing that in there, it's, that's not really, okay, so that's not, that's changing the, the narrative of Batman. Because you, because the whole point of Batman in the comic books is that you never know who kills his parents. So basically, that's that's an Easter egg and it's an homage to um, all the movies, mm-hmm. right? All the all the movies that have come before it about uh, it might have been Joe Chill. Well, who the hell is Joe Chill? Joe Chill is just some random guy who winds up uh, killing Batman's, well, killing the Waynes and setting him on his way to becoming uh, Batman. I like the fact that they did that. It's 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 a nice little nice little note to the fans. Yeah, I was just thinking that it was a it was a nice little note to the fans that we can integrate what drove Bruce Wayne to become Batman mm-hmm. without taking thirty minutes to explain the murder of his parents. Yeah. It just happened just that fast, and if you were uh, an avid Batman lover, like we all are, you pick that up almost instantly. Like, that's the guy who killed his parents. And it was over just as quick as it began. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny you say that. It's like we you, how they integrated the reason Bruce Wayne becomes Batman because there is actually like four different sources. All the comic book storylines that they threw in, they all, not unless they all of them have different reasons why he became Batman, but there are a couple of different reasons. Like, the main continuity, his parents gets killed. Joe Chill is one of them. One of the people who we assume it killed Batman, because obviously we don't actually know. That's the whole point. Um, there's a different version. I want to say that it was uh, Batman Earth One. Um, that's the that, that's the storyline I was I was saying about the uh, that was another of the uh, Easter eggs I like. One of the three I got memorized. Um, uh, Earth One was the one where uh, Martha's last name is not Kane. Her last name is uh, Arkham, Arkham, right? Uh, and that's in this movie where, you know, her mom kills her dad, then commits suicide, and she basically is in and out of what becomes Arkham Asylum, this, that, and the other. Um, that's from Earth-1. That's um, And then part of that is 
well, mom's a little loopy. That's why Bruce becomes a little loopy and takes on this persona as Batman because he's a little off too, right? You have to be just a little bit off to say, I'm going to dress up like a bat and run out and beat the shit out of criminals <laughs> <laughs> until, you know, until I get my satisfaction, right? So you have to be just a little bit loopy to, to go that route. And that was part of the Earth One storyline. Um, another Easter egg that I like was um, it's not an after credit scene because there are no after credit scenes, but the Rata El Lada is actually a website. So you go to RataElLada.com, um, just like it is in the in the movie, and you get the you get the Riddler's little icon, you know, in the question mark, and it logs you in. And as it's logging in, it's running like this, the DOS code, where you know it, it all these numbers and this, that, and the other, just, and then it, it boots up. Um, if you look at those codes, uh, and I'm gonna post a picture on uh, Instagram later. Um, uh, if you look at those codes and you read them, these codes are not just, you know, computer talk. They're not just there by happenstance. Each one references a specific comic book. Um, there's six or seven codes, right? Uh, one of them, uh, they're, they're all first editions or first appearances of X. Uh, it's the first appearance of Batman in Detective Comics or whatever. It's, uh, one of them is the first appearance of Carmine Falcone, which is the storyline of, you know, him getting shot and... Uh, uh, him being a criminal undermine and, and, and um, Thomas Wayne uh, fixing him up in the middle of the night. Um, one is the first appearance of Catwoman. One is the first appearance of the Joker. Another one is the first appearance of the Penguin. Um, but that last one, that last code, is really cool because it's the first appearance of, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but he was another villain, and that's why I say it's another villain that they, um, I want to say it's the first appearance of uh, Dr. Freeze. Ah, yeah, yeah say, right. they may have been talking about that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so I mean, you could get. I mean, I don't, I don't think they're gonna. Uh, you're not gonna get the Arnold Schwarzenegger shtick, right? <laughs> uh, everybody, chill, right? You, you're, you're not gonna get that. But I can see them having a guy who's a scientist who believes in cryogenics, because um, cryogenics is actually a big thing now. I don't know if nobody actually knows that. If you look at science magazines and read like I do, because I'm a giant nerd, um, <laughs> um, you have. Uh, cryogenics going on right now for real and they're trying to figure out how to do cryogenics and they're trying to figure out how to apply it to space travel um, but you can, I can see them doing a movie where there's a guy who's really into cryogenics just like it's going on now and he believes in it um, some sort of uh, espionage on the corporate level he gets you know, attacked in the middle of the night because he's still in his lab working you throw the, the, the stuff that he uses to help cryogenically freeze somebody um, but this is after he's already cryogenically frozen his wife until he can figure out, you know, how to save her life because remember that's the whole point. Um, and I can see them running that storyline. He doesn't need the suit; it's unnecessary. He doesn't actually need the freeze gun, but that'd be kind of damn cool if he had the freeze gun. Um, so I can see them easily doing that. I and mean, you ain't got to do that in the next movie. Hell, you can just hell, you can put that on uh, one of the HBO Max shows. But that would still be very cool, very interesting to see. You know, uh, Matt Reeves, I believe that he wants to stay grounded in uh, reality as far as his Cape Crusader goes. Yeah. So you want to do more um, human, uh, more more um, more villains that you can actually uh, gravitate to on a human scale. And Victor Freeze is probably one of the most human characters. Mm -hmm. This guy has literally become a villain in an attempt to save the one well. he loves. So it's like, how much more human can you become? Yeah. I mean, we're all villains if that's the case. I mean, hell, they... Uh... They made the Riller one hell of a human character because they took, they took a, a completely joke of a character, right? The, this even more than the Joker, he's a clown, right? And they made him into a completely vicious threat. Oh my goodness! Look, yo, yo. He, I mean, think, I mean, think about it. He goes from answering, answering, answer this riddle, and I give you another clue, and you can stop the bomb. Ha ha ha! Just that another walking around with a cane shaped like a question mark. He went from that to basically a. Serial killer smash terrorists. Bludgeoning people in the back of their heads. <laughs> Seriously. Yo, like, bro, so Paul I, I, I got to give uh, my hat. I got to take my hat off to Paul Dano in his scene where he was locked up in Arkham and the bombs were going off. That scene was terrifying. His acting was captivating. Those bombs were going off. That music, I think it was uh, Santa Maria. What was the name of that song they was playing? Uh, yeah, Ave Maria. Ah, yes. That was playing in the background. He's singing along to that. 
the bombs are going off and he's like boom i was like this is terrifying it's a, it really just it was so captivating to watch that performance as like you said the riddler who was at one point just a joke and now you're looking at this guy he he has succeeded where so many have failed it was it was actually a good it was a, a pretty spectacle just to watch it's yeah, really the, captivating yeah the uh the also on that rap also on that website that rafa a lot of when um and it gets done going through all those codes and booting up it gives you this little thing that says um loading 98 percent complete and then right above it is this little link that says click for your prize so you click it and it gives you the similar to the the code in, that he was uh, passing around in the movie right uh-huh. they give you the sheet so um, you can decipher it so you have to decipher it <laughs> now you don't actually have you know the freaking thing to do it but obviously this is we're in the age of internet nerds out there worldwide. Somebody, will figure Somebody it out. has figured it out. So the little thing it says, uh, "Fear he who hides behind one." Yeah, you search for the right answers, but you need to look deeper. And the answer is a mask. Obviously, you, you need a mask. Uh, then it moves on to the next one. Uh, it says, is that "Now you've achieved the highest score. Here's something you've never seen before." Then you click it again for the reward, and then that's the end of the game. Uh, but they give you a message right at the end of it. It says, "Thomas Wayne lied." So I thought that was I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, that that's not an after credit scene. That's quote unquote the after credit website. Uh, and I thought that's that was pretty, different. Yeah, I thought. I mean, that, that's, that's the different. only other movie that, I can think that gives of, you something to take home with you. Yeah, the only other movie I think that I can remember where they use a website to interact with the movie and give you something extra on top of the movie was The Matrix, the original one. Hmm. They didn't do it with Part Two. They didn't do it with Part Three, and they definitely didn't do it with this this last one, right? But the very first one. They, that website had a lot of things from the movie. You went to the Matrix website, and if you saw the movie, you plug them in, and it would give you like mini games, and they would show you different things and background and be- behind the scenes credits. Just the first time I've actually seen it do it. It's kind of cool. I, I I really appreciate them actually doing that. Uh, I can't think of. Um, I think no, the other one was Hush, but we talked about it before. Maybe Hush is the next villain. Would you like? I, I personally, m- more than pretty much anybody else I know, if Hush is the next villain for another Matt Reeves Batman movie, it would make sense. Here you have the Riddler who's just a normal guy, right? And they've you've turned what was a joke of a character into a terrorist slash serial killer, mastermind, who's going to be buddy-buddy with the Joker. That's who Barry Keegan is at the end. That's who he's talking about. Mm-hmm. That's who he's talking to while they're sitting in Arkham. What if the next villain is somebody in the same vein, which would be Hush. Why not? He's just as vicious as this version of the Riddler. He has pretty much, his, I wouldn't say the same motives, but similar motives for wanting to take out Batman and Bruce Wayne, this, that, and the other. Makes sense. This is another villain that we haven't actually seen used in, I'm not going to say not at all, because he's obviously been in the... Um, uh, animated version, yeah, yeah, but animated. Uh, but we haven't seen him in live action movies. This is another villain that they can that they can use instead like, of going to camp. I like to way. see Hush. However, I think it's too early in his story. It's too early in the Batman story. If we're talking Batman Year Two, I think Hush needs to come out the shadows a little bit later after after Bruce Wayne has um, proven to be more successful. Okay, you know, as 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 the Dark Knight, as he's actually. You know what I'm saying? Um, start to come into age as to who he is, his purpose. Because right now, he is quote-unquote vengeance. And he realizes that vengeance is not working. Gotham needs something else. Gotham needs a hero. Gotham needs hope. Now, see, once he becomes hope and he's successful being hope, then you want to send Hush in because Hush, unlike many other of the uh, Batman's rose gallery, Hush actually knows who Bruce Wayne is. Yeah. So, that is going to help tear him down. But let's first build up Bruce Wayne before we immediately start tearing him down. I like to see other characters in there. Now, the one character that's been constantly going through my head that I, well, there's actually two characters that I would love to see. Because I, I really want to see the Court of Owls. I really want to see the Court of Owls. Now, see, here's the problem with doing the Court of Owls in a Matt Reeves movie. You can do the Court of Owls in a Matt Reeves movie, but that sort of steps on the toes of Gotham Knights, which they are doing the video game and they're doing a live action series for it. So are you, I mean, you could do it 
and you tie the series into the movie. That's mm -hmm. possible. We've seen yeah. Marvel do it because it's yeah, not that hard. Video game. Yeah, if you got the video game, you got the live action series, then you do a movie. You can tie all of them together. It's not that hard. If Marvel can do it, now that you have Matt Reeves, who obviously has an eye for this, you can do it. I don't want DC doing what Marvel does. Mm -hmm. I want DC to do its own thing. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. The best the best DC has done thus far now is this movie and Aquaman and then the first Wonder Woman, right? You those are, I, of all the DC movies, those are my top 3 right now. Uh, not counting uh The Watchmen, which I think is the best uh comic book movie of all time, but that's a whole other discussion. Um Shazam didn't suck. Shazam didn't suck. I I like I like Shazam a lot. I I I've always had a problem with the Shazam character. I, it's not that I hate him. I just always thought he was just out there too far fetched for me to believe. Even though I can believe in an alien with freezing breath and laser <laughs> visions, but whatever, whatever, whatever. Oh, or uh, Wonder Woman. Because I love Wonder Woman, but her origin changes like the wind. <laughs> they have look. I, the side note: so we go, we go, we go step back to Batman in a second. But side note: just because you brought that up, Wonder Woman has always had the worst, the worst, absolute worst. Hands down, the worst origin story of anybody in the Justice League. Her mm -hmm. entire island is nothing but warrior women. Nothing but warrior women. You know nothing of men. Outcast by Zeus. Outcast by Zeus. The only thing you know of men is that they're all evil. They're all treacherous. You can't trust any of them. We're on this island because the world of men is constantly at war, constantly trying to kill each other. And we don't want no part of it. Let them kill each other. We live here in peace. We live here in prosperity. And the only reason <laughs> we train as warriors is because if they ever come to our doorstep, we're going to give them what for. Right? right. Okay. First man you meet. Here comes Bye, Steve mom. <laughs> Here comes Steve really? Trevor. <laughs> and this is the woman. That, and this is the woman they keep talking about. Oh, she's a feminist icon. No, no, she's not. She's no. <laughs> she's the worst feminist. If she is, she's the worst feminist icon I've ever met in my life. Your first instinct is to the hell with, with mom. <laughs> I'm leaving with the guy. That is not a good origin. You could have come up with. You could come up with nothing better. I understand that this was golden age. Yeah. comics when she was introduced and this was like okay that makes sense it's 2022 y'all better come up with something better you've retconned pretty much every comic book character out there marvel dc this that and the other way everybody's been retconned you need to be retconning her quickly come up with a better origin now nah, we go back to batman <laughs> sorry about that side note folks <laughs> um oh uh, what, what were we talking about well listen let's talk about colin Farrell. okay so let's talk about colin Farrell. so uh we both seen the movie twice Okay, so the first time out, again, I wasn't looking for much. I was just enjoying the movie. I was enjoying the camaraderie, the friendship. We were just out having a good time at our wives' out. It was, it was great. It was a great evening. I was just there because my expectations for Robert Pattinson as Batman was so low that I was just like, I'm going to go in with no expectations at all. That way I'm guaranteed to like the movie. Yeah, but by the time the movie, but when you first see Batman, when he step out the shadows in the subway, yo, my expectations shot there through the roof. I was like, "This is amazing!" But now, now, quick side, I didn't mean to cut you off, but quick to that, that subway scene, which is nothing but these dudes about to beat the shit out of this Asian dude. Stop <laughs> Asian hate America, <laughs> right? Um, which. Oddly enough, that's another Easter egg. The 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 kid that he scares straight at the end uh -huh. is the same dude that played Tim Drake on the, yeah, on the, the series. On the show. Yeah. yeah, on the show. Uh, yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but they're about to beat this guy up, and all you get introducing Batman is not him swooping down and being flashy, this, that, and the other, right? All you get is this loud thumping, boom, doom. Doom. It's not even the footsteps. It's the the music in the background. Is that 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 music, and it's it's getting louder. It's like they're playing the same refrain. They play like five or six notes. Then go back to it and play a little louder. Go back to the beginning and play a little louder. And it's like they're telling you we're ramping up. It's some shit about to jump off. And all you get on top of that is them footsteps. Them damn boots. <laughs> right? Every single time you see Robert Pattinson really, really about to get into it, like right after the penguin flipped his car mm -hmm. and he's walking up to him when, before he leans in and looks at him, he, all you get is them footsteps. And those boots... And you do you notice that every time he steps down with those boots, they ching like the old old uh, western movies with the spurs, like the the sheriff has yeah. come to town, yeah. like the big sheriff is the really only one. Did, did you that and the, you you get that sound that like ching. <laughs> it was it was terrifying. Ching. And I, that, that was terrifying. And that was and I appreciated that so much because that is that is a attention to detail, honestly, that no other Batman movie has ever done. You've always gotten Batman 
coming out of the shadows, beating the shit out of the villain, jumping back into the shadows, right? He met his man, he met his match with Bane because you know you merely adopted the dog. That shit. But this one, he's like, yeah, it's like I use fear because fear is a good tool, which is an homage to all the shit that Nolan did. That's where he that's what he learned from, you know, the League of Shadows. Um which is oddly enough, I just thought about it. That's that line is I I I use fear because fear is a fear in the dark is a good tool. That's a good Easter egg to throw back because this movie uh, I'll get that in a second. Um but that I love that fact that that those footsteps is all you get. All you get is his feet. All you all you see is his feet stomping on the ground and the dudes that's the these they're all dressed yep. up like the Joker. They're, they're basically they're all... the Joker gang from from uh from the Justice League um uh, um uh, run of cartoons. Dwayne McDuffie wrote those. Um, he that's all you get, and then you see them all like backing up, like "Oh shit, he's here!" Like you all saw, looked up and saw the symbol right in the sky that Gordon cuts on every so often. Yeah. Just do because what, what, what did he say? He said, "I can't be everywhere, everywhere at once." At but, once, but you don't know but you where. Don't know where I'm, I am. Yeah, they don't know where <laughs> I'm going to be. So he like yeah, and that's when he goes into the it, it's a fear thing, and I use fear. I use he's like. Fear is in the darkness. They think I'm in the dark, but you know, fear and darkness are are good tools against against the uninitiated. Again, that goes to Bane. Um, I love the fact that he just walks out. They all look at him and they's like, "Oh, really? This dude's my height. He's Joker. This this cat ain't got it." Mm. And what he do? He bludgeons that first dude down and then just eyeballs everybody and says, "I am vengeance." And everybody's like, "Oh." I've been waiting to say this about this movie. I'm waiting to say this. I'm gonna say it now. What separates this Batman movie? I think we're I think we're thinking the same thing. Go ahead. From all the other movies, is the level of combat that was thrown into this movie. Most of the Batman movies, it's a one punch and a kick, and then the villain goes down. There's no real hand to hand martial arts, and I'm a big fan of martial arts. You know me. Mm-hmm. I've studied for years boxing, the um, all all these physical techniques. When I seen this. In this movie, when he got that Joker from the beginning and just wrecked him and then looked up and said, I am vengeance, I almost jumped out my seat. I was like, this is the Batman that we deserve. This is this version of Batman is the version that first debuted in comics, period. <laughs> the first. OK, so if nobody knows and if you don't know the first run of Batman comic, Batman killed people. He did it with his own hand. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. oh Batman killed people. Oh, yeah, because that dude at the end, he woo. Yeah. He so, suffered. Yeah, Batman killed people in the first outing of Batman in the in the comic books. Batman wasn't he didn't use guns. <laughs> beat you to death. He beat you to death. <laughs> the first the whole the whole the whole the whole mythology of the Joker is the first time he's introduced in comics, Batman was meant to kill him. Oh, that's why he threw him into the back. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, he was meant to kill him. The Joker was never meant to be this long-standing villain, but they got such a blowback because you know he's coming right after Superman. So he's just the same comic book company. It's like, how can you have this dude just be outright brutal like this when Superman is so virtuous yeah, and so? At some point, you're gonna have to make Superman take him down. Yeah. So they was like, okay, so we won't have him kill anybody else. It'll just be part of his code where he doesn't kill because you know that happened to him and he doesn't want to be like them. So I don't kill. I'll find another way. And that became the Batman mythology. But his first his first runs out, he would smoke a dude. He he wasn't about that. I think one of the I want to say I can't remember if it what issue it was, but one of the comics. He drowns a guy. He chases a guy down, um, and he drowns the guy. Not in water, but in a pit of solidifying concrete. Mm. He literally stands on the guy's back while the guy can't get up. So the guy can't get up, and he's face down in this this freshly poured <laughs> concrete slab. And the dude <laughs> drowns the concrete <laughs> until he can't move anymore. He can't move anymore, and it's like, <laughs> and then he just leaves him. It just dips. So it's like. Yeah, it was like, yeah, Batman used to kill people. It was like, this, this whole idea that Batman never killed somebody is completely wrong. There yeah. was a few incidents where Batman had, <laughs> had really whacked the dude. You just have to... He came around. <laughs> yeah, you have to You have to just go back far enough. It was episodes in comic books. I mean, I mean, it was comic book issues where Batman had whacked the dude early on, and then they changed it to, you know, to fit the, 
idea that okay, fit the narrative. just fit the narrative. He had to be a, her- a hero. Yeah, he had to be on the same level mm-hmm. as Superman. Superman yeah. doesn't kill unless you're like some monster, like you know, like uh, whatever. So he had to fit that. Everybody in the Justice League wound up having to basically have that same code. But yeah, Batman used to kill people. Mm-hmm. So him wrecking these dudes and being just completely brutal, I was like, now nah, we are cooking. Mm-hmm. Because you have never seen this level of brutality in no other Batman movie. I'm not knocking the other Batman movies because I like damn near all of them. No, but you haven't. But you've never seen that level of brutality. It it hasn't. It has not been that level of brutality. When he went into that, the bar, he goes in there and he's looking for the penguin. Yeah. That was, uh, and and this is what human, this is what made uh, Robert Pattinson's Batman so human to me. When he came in that bar looking to speak to Penguin, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Penguin was the main guy who was going in there. You can see the frustration. Not not just frustration. Not what I'm looking for. Uh, um, It was. It was. There was a level of I I don't know. I want to say frustration, but at the same time, he went into that bar, and he was panicked, like he was looking around like a like a wild animal. He was looking for the penguin, but he didn't know where to find him. That's why he knocked and said, hey, take me to him. They didn't. He bars in, not knowing where the penguin is, and then he gets attacked by 10 plus men, and he's got to battle them all. Now, there's got to be a realization in his head that he's probably going to fight all night long, Mm -hmm. and the way, as human as he was, he was probably going to lose that fight Mm -hmm. because, I mean, they really humanized his fighting skills, which was was to get me back to the villain that I want to see if they do another one. But there was a, 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 a level of uh, not not just determination, but this guy, when he goes into that club and he's fighting those guys with all the, the brutality and the force that he could muster, he was laying those guys down. Mm-hmm. And then out of nowhere, here comes Penguin and the fight stops. And you just, you see like the, he just, it was like a, a sigh of relief came across him. Like, I don't have to fight anymore. Yeah. You know, because he was really getting wrecked in there. Not as- that's another thing I appreciate before we go back to uh, Colin Farrell's The Penguin. That's another thing I appreciate about Robert Pattinson as Batman. Most Batman characters don't get hurt, right? This guy was getting wrecked. He was getting, he got more wrecked in this than all three movies from Nolan. <laughs> Combined. Combined. <laughs> Christian Bale did not take the, okay, I get you. <laughs> Christian Bale got gassed by Scarecrow. He got his back broken by Bane. He got you know, stabbed a couple times. He got beat up a couple times. True indeed. If you add all that together, it does not amount to the amount of wreck that Robert Pattinson took in this one no. film. This dude took a shotgun blast Yo. to the chest that laid him down. So check hard. it out, right? Be glad that Batman suit is bulletproof. So check it out, right? One of the things that I noticed, and I don't know if you picked this up, but his his cow, the mask that he wears, End of the movie, there's a crack in it mm-hmm. right above his eye. Yep. I'm like, this dude was getting wrecked. He was getting pounded. <laughs> he was getting... Bro, oh look. The the, the end the end fight sequence when he's on top of what what is basically the, the, the jumbotron in the middle of the stadium. And there he's basically going around this square or ring, whatever the hell above everybody else. And he's fighting off these snipers, all these dudes that are and he for every dude that he beats. He takes two or three shots. Yeah. He, get, he either gets shot Back by a head. small hand, he gets cracked, right? He gets punched, punched. He gets kicked. He takes the shotgun blast. Somebody hits him over the head with the with the butt of the gun. By the time it's done and somebody up there finally gets, you know, he finally, like, passes out from taking his ass with him. And then somebody grabs mm-hmm. Selena, who comes in and helps him at the uh, toward the end. He's He can't get up. He needs that shot of venom yeah. slash adrenaline with it, the green stuff. Yeah, you, right. You, you heard what the penguin said. I got you. I got you. I got you. you do you know what that reminded <laughs> me of? I kid you not. Okay, uh, here's a here's why I'm I'm just the world's total nerd. I, I'm I got to be the number one. If I'm not number one nerd, I'm I'm at least number. I'm in the top five. The second Colin Farrell as the penguin goes into that, I got you. I got you. I got you. Immediately, and I don't know why, but it threw me back to the Michael Jackson movie Moonwalker. <laughs> that was that. Uh, that was Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe, tell me, and you, and now, now, now that I've called it out, 
tell me that I'm lying. He sounded like it sounded like he was channeling that Joe Pesci when he think my, you know the, the big giant robot Michael Jackson had been shot and he done knocked him off, you know, knocked him down. He's like, I got you, I got you. It sounded just like him. I was like, he could have been telling that. I, I, dude, oh I, I was like, he's channeling Joe Pesci, and I was like, I gotta be the only asshole who was thinking this, but okay, I'll, I'll be the only person to think it, but that's exactly who it sounded like to me. All right, um, listen, before we get back to Colin Farrell, because I really want to say this about Colin Farrell, but I want to add this other Easter egg that I noticed, because it, it leads me to the person that I would love to see in the next installment of this. Okay. In the beginning of the movie, when you see the mayor, when the, the, the Riddler's watching from the other building with the binoculars mm -hmm. into the, the mayor's house, the mayor's son is dressed up like a ninja. The League of Assassins. Yeah, but see, that's Ra's al Ghul. Right. Which is also Lady Shiva. Shiva. I would love to see Lady Shiva in the next installment. But see, here's the problem with that. That kind of toe that kind of tiptoes too far to the line of keeping the characters humanly grounded. Because Ra's al Ghul is what, a hundred some odd or two hundred, three hundred thousand years or whatever. That's true. Because of the because of the pit of resurrection. So, if that's the case, you kind of have to have another. You kind of have to roll Liam, like Liam. You have got to roll Liam Neeson out there again. <laughs> like, not exactly get oh, Liam Neeson. I, I hate it really, Liam Neeson as well, though, because he he played uh Henry Ducard at the same time, and I just uh, Henry Ducard and Liam uh, and uh, Ra's al Ghul not the same person. Yeah, they're not. You know, and and that always bothered me about that. I mean, I understand how every director or writer is going to change things to fit their own nar narrative but when you come to like comic book fans like myself or like you we just we know things you know when, when the certain things are changed it kind of irks us a little bit yeah and even though it was still a good movie it was a damn good movie i, I loved it I, I watched that entire movie i watched batman begins in slow motion <laughs> the entire movie i did okay i watched the entire that. movie in slow motion i love the movie but, you know, there was just certain things about it that I, I couldn't get with. I can tell you who... I, I can give you another theory of who could be the next villain. And then we'll get back to Colin Farrell. Death Stroke. No. Even though Henry Maggio, Maggianella... Yeah, Maggianella, Joe, Joe Maggianella. Yeah, he said team. he's already confirmed that he's coming back as Death Stroke okay. at some point. Yeah, but so you know you what they're could. gonna they're gonna bring him into the see because this Batman, this uh Matt Reeves version of Batman is not the the D C E U. It's it's not that. Yeah, this is not. this is a standalone. Yeah. So if Joe Magnanello is gonna come back, he's coming back to the D C E U, which is gonna be the um because <clears throat> Michael Keaton is already confirmed for being on the set of uh Batgirl. Yeah. So even even Batgirl, which I was thinking because uh, what's what's her name? Uh, Grace, the the chick that's playing Batgirl. Uh, can't think of her name right yeah. now. Uh, but her her heritage, so she's Latino. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking with the uh, with uh, what's my man name? Wright. Um, Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright. I'm thinking she could play as Jeffrey Wright's daughter ish because Barbara Gordon. Gordon yeah. That would have worked until I found out that this is. This Batman is not part of the DCEU. This, this has nothing to do with that. So that kind of threw me off for you know, hoping that uh, Joe Magnello would come back as playing Deathstroke. So we would actually need an entire but different see, but, he, but you know what I like about that is you can still have him show up. You can just say he's, okay, that's, you know him as Gordon. This is his daughter. Yeah. Just roll with it. It's still but interesting. it's something, like I said before, the best DC movies are the standalone ones that don't connect to don't each connect other. Don't connect to each other. Not like the Marvel Universe and everything's connected. And that's fine because it's like, okay, if I want an interconnected story, I watch Marvel. If I just want standalone and I just want to see these guys and then eventually you can do a movie with them together, it, whatever, if you want to, or mm -hmm. DC. Yeah, I don't. So I'm trying to copycat. I, you know, just yeah, do your own thing. Yeah, there's no reason for them to have to do the exact yeah. same just thing. Just do, do your own yeah, thing. Do your own thing you and, know, it, and it works out. That's what you're going to Now, uh, going back to the guy who I could see as the uh, next villain, who could be the next villain. Um, so, the Riddler is on this killing spree. He's killing all the the higher ups and going down the line, right? Um, he's his, at the at the I'm gonna say at the bottom of the list, but the last one is he's trying to get to Bruce Wayne because obviously Thomas Wayne is already dead. Um, he kills the DA. In the comic books, this DA gets killed, 
and the assistant DA takes his job. Who's the assistant DA? You're thinking of uh, Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent. Which means you could get Two Face. Now, in the comics, which they've stepped all over the comics, obviously, they've melded stories together. They've just used characters here and there, which I'm fine with that. It's no big deal. In the comics, Harvey gets the scar from uh, Boss Maroney throwing acid in his face during the trial. So you obviously can't have the comic book completely comic book aggregate because Maroney's already dead inside this universe. He's, Carmine Falcone took over after Maroney, you know, gets arrested and killed this at the other. But who's to say that you just can't have one of the Penguin's guys on trial, right? And he's going after the Penguin, who is now the big crime guy now that Falcone is dead. Now Penguin is taking over everything. He's the biggest guy in Gotham that you now you're trying to take down. Here comes the assistant DA. Just leave him as assistant DA. He doesn't have to be promoted to the head DA just yet. Just like Gordon is not the commissioner yet. He's Lieutenant Gordon. He's in the middle of the precinct. Um, you just have him, one of the one of Penguin's guys, get caught. And it looks like he's going to snitch. Right? So in, in, in open court, you have somebody try to assassinate this guy on the stand that's about to snitch. And they're going to throw either throw acid on him or shoot him, but Dent jumps in front of him to try to save his witness. He gets That's how he gets scarred, right? Maybe it's a guy jump up with a shotgun, goes to shoot the guy on the stand, and Harvey eats it in half of his face. People in real life live from that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But it leaves, them, horribly scarred. it leaves them horribly scarred. So you, can, you could possibly see Harvey Dent slash Two-Face be the next villain because then it becomes... Here I am throwing my everything at doing it. It's basically doing exactly what they did in the Nolan series, right? Do the exact same thing, but you stretch it out. It could probably be another three-hour movie, but you stretch it out, and you have, you know, you have you see Harvey as the assistant DA become Two Face, like in the first and second act, and then the last two acts is him taking out people left and right, and Batman has to go stop this guy who he thought was on his side. And by the end of that movie, you also have. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Gordon become Commissioner Gordon. He gets finally gets appointed. You're basically just doing the Nolan movie, but you're doing it dark. You know, I don't want to use darker tone. I'll, I'll use gritty. I hate using. I hate saying the gritty, movie is darker. Is yeah. uh, a more you get a more grittier version. So who who, who do you think goes in as a a secondary villain? If you're going to have uh, Two Face come around as the villain in the later half of the movie, who's the the first villain? Penguin. You roll him right out of the series, right back into the movie, and you have him be the main villain. Hmm. But you have Harvey Dent on, you know, on deck to become Two Face, and then he walks into uh, the Forty Four Below Club, which oddly enough, the Forty Four Below Club is the club that the Penguin owns in the comic mm-hmm. books. Um, which was also in the movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is also in the movie. Which oddly enough, it's also underground, so Forty Four Below and, and it's underground. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a neat little thing. Um, and you know that that whole scene. Side note: that whole scene of him walking back into the club, that's right out of. Batman Begins. Because remember in the, in, the, in the first movie, Christian Bale walks into the club and, he, and he, you know, and he's talking to Maroney who's sitting at the table. And he was like, I'm not afraid of you. And then the guy, he pulls the gun out and he's like, he's like, he's like you see this? He's like, look around the room. He's like, you got the judge over, you got the, the top judge over there, you got the chief of police over there, this, that, and the other. You know, I can shoot you right now in the face and they'll drag you out of here and nothing to touch me. Right? Isn't that the exact same thing that basically... Robert Pattinson does in this one. He goes in first as Batman, then he goes in as Bruce Wayne, <laughs> and he's like eyeballing the Penguin, and and then he's eyeballing Falcone. He's basically doing the same standoff. Yeah. Well, and I, there, I thought that and there's cops in there. There's cops in there. There's judges in there, and everything. Mm-hmm. So that's the whole DEA so office. Was yeah, the whole the, the whole every DEA last one was in there. Yeah, which is that's why I say the whole DEA office is in mm-hmm. there. That's why I say you can you can roll out Harvey Dent as a secondary villain along with the Penguin right out of out of his now greenlit series. You mm-hmm. can run that. You know, I, I guess with me, I'm just I'm nostalgic about one character in particular that they haven't done a live live uh, adaption of, and I would just love to see Clayface. I would love to see uh, was uh, uh, Carlo, right? That's the name. Um, uh, what was his name when he? What was his name? It was oh god, I can't remember the name of the guy who was supposed to be. Are we, okay, so are we going to do? Because there's two different Clayface, if I'm not mistaken. The There's actor, one, yeah, the, the guy that was the actor, mm-hmm. that's which is the, I'm which is the main one you see in all of the animated yeah, versions. That's and then the one it was I'm a, about. it was another guy who found the stuff after that after that one had gotten killed. There's another yeah. guy who I'm talking about the, the actor. I'm talking yeah. about 
I want to see a, 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 a washed up actor who finds this, you know, um, substance to help him change his person, change his, his appearance. Yeah. And then begins to become addicted to it and then use it to commit crimes. You know, not only just get himself back established as a great movie star, but then he starts to commit crimes. And then that gets that puts the great the world's greatest detective on his case. I would love to see that. I mean, I might be it might be a long shot. I don't. They, I mean, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Clayface as a character, but again, this is something me and you both agreed on. This is supposed to be as grounded in reality as possible. Yeah. So yeah. if this is, how do you get this guy who uses a cream to <laughs> literally <laughs> mold his face like Play Doh into something else? <laughs> Dark man. <laughs> I, look. Look at Dark Man. Don't you hate on Dark Man? <laughs> That's one of those movies that you know is bad, but you sit and watch it anyway because it's like this is too ridiculous not to watch. That's one of those movies. Look at Dark uh, Man. His face start bubbling in the sun. Wasn't that Liam Neeson? Yeah, it was Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me with the washed up actor and this is gonna be Liam Neeson playing right. Clayface? All right, let's move on. Let's let's talk about let's talk about Zoe Kravitz. Okay, look. Let's talk about Catwoman. And, I told uh, I told it, I told everybody the moment <laughs> they cast her and they said, "Yeah, Zoe Kravitz is gonna be our Catwoman." I was like, "It ain't gonna be no better Catwoman, not for a long mm-hmm. time." Okay. So I, look, I, Zoe Kravitz was right off the comic book page, right into From the, the movie. hairstyle to the walk, the pixie cut, oh, the walk, goodness. the way she walked. I will never forget it. I mean, I have dreamed about this ever since I've seen the movie. I mean, yo, I've just been dreaming about the way she walks, or the sway, the hips. It is right out of the animated cartoon. It's right out of it. It's like they plucked her. She must have studied the footage of the animated cartoon. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and honestly, that was the part that got me. She looked so much like the animated version from Batman animated series yes, version of did. Catwoman. I was like, that exactly. is the, the scary. Same frame. The haircut, it was it really was scary. That's why I keep asking you, have you watched Catwoman Hunted yet? Have no, I yet? swear to God, every single time I try to watch it, I forget all something else Yo, always comes up. I have literally I watched watch this it movie today. like three times. I will watch it today. Yo, as soon I'm as in I'm love done. with Catwoman Hunted. As soon as as soon as we're done, I will watch it because okay. Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman, like I said, was scary. Because like, okay, so she's in the club. And this is when Robert Pattinson and broke in as Batman and he's talking to the Penguin, which before we go on with that, that whole scene is what made Penguin for me, what Colin Farrell as the Penguin, because he stops everybody from fighting him. And instead of him trying to act all tough, it's like, hey, you see how many guys I got? Get the hell out of here. You know, if I put them all on you, he's like, hey, chill. I was like, I ain't worried about him. I was like, come on, man, let's go back in and mm-hmm. talk. That's a level of toughness and brashness that you have never seen with any version of the penguin yeah. not in live action with danny devito not in any animated version he's always None. been a weasel he's always been a weasel this is a guy who understands his role in the world right i might be an underboss i am not the top guy That's but true. at the same time you don't scare me yeah that was colin farrell that was colin farrell god damn listen, colin farrell made listen, that role back to colin farrell because i wanted to say this i wanted to say this I seen the movie twice. The first time I just enjoyed the movie. The second time I went in there knowing that, hey, this is Colin Farrell. I'm going to see him in that makeup. I still don't see Colin Farrell in the makeup. No. Now I, I, his mannerisms a little bit. Yes, I was able to say, yeah, that that's him. But in the end, whoever did this man's makeup, if they're going to do that same thing to the guy that they got playing the Joker, we are in for a surprise when we see this dude, man. I'm, no. I'm just saying. The Colin I, Farrell as the Penguin was intense. I, I did not. There are movies when people do makeup to this level. Obviously, prosthetics. He has on prosthetics, right? Face, right. body. He has on a fat suit to mm-hmm. make him bigger because Colin Farrell's not a fat dude. No, no. no. Don't stretch your imagination. Um, everything was on point. But there are movies when people wear prosthetics, do makeup, and you still see them. Yeah, you missed out fire. Missed out fire, right? You can still see <laughs> Big that. Mama's house. Yeah, you still see this, you know, the clumps, all that. You you still you can still see them. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, it's, it's you. I'm okay with it. I'm suspended reality. This is a movie. That's what I'm supposed to do. At no point after watching that movie twice did I say, I see Colin Taylor. Never. No. Never. Never. The only if you didn't, if nobody told you this was Colin Farrell in this in this suit, in this prosthetics, in this makeup, if nobody told you. 
you would have never known that was Listen, Colin Farrell. Listen, when I seen the, the trailer for the movie, okay, when the first trailer was dropping and everything, of course, I'm going to go online and check it out. For weeks, and I do mean for weeks, until somebody finally corrected me. I thought that was Robert De Niro. Really? It was like, I got you. I got you. I was like, oh, Robert De Niro is the penguin. This is going to be excellent. Robert De Niro? Yeah, I still don't see Colin Farrell in that makeup. I still don't see him. At all. I didn't see. That's not a. That's one of them situations. Hold on, because you mentioned this before. How these guys are jumping ship. I mean, of course, they're going with the money was, but you got Colin Farrell who played uh, Bullseye. Bullseye. Mm-hmm. Okay, in a, in a not so successful movie for Marvel, he jumps ship, comes over to DC, plays the Penguin, and has I don't know triumphed. I don't, I don't even know what what to say because you got one character not so well, the other one through the roof. Like this is he, he really knocked that out. Colin Farrell can, continues my uh my theory from the last time we talked. Remember? Okay, so we yeah, you know, I was getting that's what I was we, saying. We were talking about it before, and I said everybody that has played a superhero at some point. And was trash. Everybody <laughs> gets a redemption story. Everybody that has been in a comic book movie and they were trash, and everybody agrees. Ryan Reynolds. That was bad, right? Every single everybody. <laughs> there is no Ryan Reynolds, Ben Affleck. Um, uh, who's the dude that played Jonah Hex and then played Thanos? I always forget his name. Uh, Josh Brolin. Uh, Josh Brolin. Every <laughs> single person that has played somebody and was been bad, and it's like, ee, they have all had a redemption story. Here's his. Mm-hmm. It sure is. Here's it his. Is, it sure is. Not that his bullseye was just th- that no, bad. That just movie like, just wasn't great. That movie just didn't captivate people like it should have. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it was before its time or people just didn't understand the nature of what, what um, <clears throat> Daredevil was to bring to the table. Or maybe it just because it wasn't gritty enough. You know, Deadpool, not Deadpool, but uh, Daredevil, he's an R rated character. It's mm-hmm. just what he is. You, you make a PG 13 or a PG. Um, Daredevil, and I mean, it's just not going to gravitate towards um, you know true fans. Um, Only thing that was stepping out of, out of the, the shadows was Blade at that time. Blade was trying to do his own thing. And most people, and let's be for real, maybe ten percent of the planet knew that Blade was a comic book character. Yeah, I did. And and now that we have my oh God, have mercy! I can't wait for Midnight Suns because I know they're going to do it. It's in my blood. I, if they do a Midnight, they're going to do a Midnight Suns movie. I would rather for them to do a Midnight Suns series on Disney Plus. It would be better. But they're going to do a Midnight Suns movie. They need to do a series point. because they need to get people more uh, introduced to the characters, you know, and how they uh, gel together like they would, like they did with the Defenders. Yeah. Uh, but going back to Zoe Kravitz. Yeah, going back to Zoe Kravitz. One of the things <laughs> I appreciated about her whole character work was the costume. Hmm. So every Catwoman version, period, always had the same cat suit, right? I think Anne Hathaway's was, I'm not going to say the most accurate, but I think hers was the most functionally correct, right? Her cat ears was the mask when she pulled it up. And when she put it back down, it was just a mask, right? It, was, it wasn't that she was trying to make herself look like a cat, even though she called herself Catwoman. Um, even though actually they didn't call her Catwoman in the movie. It was, it was always Selena, no matter where, where she was. But she, they had the same costume, but it made each part of her costume function, right? Until they get to this. Every part of her costume is functioning. The problem with Anne Hathaway's character, uh, her character's outfit is the is the one thing that they corrected with Zoe Kravitz. Zoe Kravitz not wearing heels. That's the one thing that I've always hated about every Catwoman character. Don't get me wrong, I understand there's a sexuality to Catwoman and there's this, you know, this unrequited love mm-hmm. until they actually do get together. Um, with Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne is that and the other. Um, which I'm glad they went out of their way to not sexualize this version of Catwoman. They literally stayed away from all of it. Yeah, they had a kiss and they had the, you know, you could tell that they liked each other, but they didn't go out of the way. Even the fact that she was in her underwear for a, for a few moments, they didn't, it was they, they, it they, was they, natural. They didn't overdo it. it yeah, was, they didn't overdo it. Was, it. it was a one shot. They didn't focus on one thing or the other. Yeah, it, it was, was basically like, her, like, okay, I gotta get out of this. I came in this. the house, I, gotta, I took this off, I put that on, and I'm, I'm back out the, out the house. You know, right. It was a sequence of events that was boom, 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 and they stepped away from it. And it was actually done in one shot. Yeah, and I was, which is great cinematography. Um, I said that on uh, on, on the last episode. That the cinematography for this, because I'm going to talk about that and the, the setting of it all in a, in a few minutes. Um, I love the fact that she didn't wear heels. She wore boots. Because let's be for real. She's a cat burglar. Where the hell is a cat woman actually going in heels? 
<laughs> You're wearing heels as Catwoman if it's a Halloween costume, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. She's wearing boots. And I'm like, thank you. She's wearing boots. Yeah, because she kicked the crap out of one dude. <laughs> She gave him, she, she gave him that, that Ken and Ryu roundhouse <laughs> yeah. kick. And then moved on without looking back at him. Oh. <laughs> that little, that little, that little, when she's um, robbing the safe, when she goes to try to find uh, Anika, her friend, and she's, and um, uh, Batman comes in behind her and says something to her, and she spins, and she goes, she's like punching, and she does that roundhouse double kick, and I'm like, whoa, right? Yeah. She moves like a fucking cat. The, the, the fighting was excellent in this. I, I, I said it before, I'll say it again. I love the fact that her. I love the fact that her mask in this is not like it's a. It's not a cat mask. I don't know what was going on with her mask. I, I thought it was some panties like on her head. But see, I, but see, here's the thing. I like it. I like the fact that you could tell it was a ski mask that she had to cut because it was much too big. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so all it was was just enough to cover her, so you can't tell the who top she of is. the ski mask. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering what it was. I, and, I thought she had some you, panties on her yeah, head. Yeah, and if you're really looking at the looking at it, it's like her hair where she has it parted and clipped. <laughs> that was the cat ears. And that was the cat ears. I, I was like, okay. I'm like, okay, I, I dig that. You, that's a little thing. I like little stuff like that where mm-hmm. they don't, you know, you don't overdo it. You just say, here it is, and we're not going to, you know, go crazy about it. I love the fact that, yeah, I'm out to steal money. Look, but... I'll say it like this. I loved Zoe Kravitz, Selena Kyle. Yeah. Her Selena Kyle was awesome. Her Catwoman was, was good, too, but... I still gotta give it to Michelle Pfeiffer, Catwoman. It's Catwoman, Michelle's the Pfeiffer's, best one. You think her her Catwoman was great. Her Selena Kyle, not so much, because Zoe Kravitz had the the personality. She just fits Selena Kyle. She fit the cat burglar mo. Michelle Pfeiffer, her I don't know her sexism. She was just she was she was graceful. I mean, it was just something about her that just really made me just believe. That Catwoman really existed in the Batman universe. This Zoe Kravitz, she was a good, you know, um, um, addition to Robert Patton's Batman as Selena Kyle. I seen her, I believe her as Selena Kyle. I would like to see her do more as Catwoman. But she really, d- she didn't do too much as Catwoman in this. I like the fact that they they barely ever referred to Robert Pattinson as Batman, and they barely referred to. Uh, Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman. They I don't think always, they referred to her as Catwoman at all, did they? That once he called, he called. He was like, he's like, it's kind of, he's, it's kind of weird for a, a for a cat burglar to be dressed as a cat. And she he did. She, she to said it. the cat in the back. That, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it's it's, it's almost no, at no point in the movie did they did regular people outside of the really refer to him directly as Batman. Mm-hmm. Everybody called him Vengeance. Even Penguin when he's busting the tech at him coming around the car. You know, and everybody else they called him vengeance. Even mm-hmm. he calls himself vengeance at the beginning when he beats the shit out of the dudes in the subway. And that, that that's actually an ode to um the uh Batman animated series when yeah. he says, I, I am vengeance. Yeah, when I he goes after when he goes at, yeah, when he goes after the I Batman. Am Batman. Yeah. Now that now that goes now that right there is a good segue into what I want to talk about next. Um the set, the cinematography, all that together. Every single part of cinematography and set pieces. Is a throwback to every Batman movie and every every episode of Batman animated series. This is not a comic book movie. I said this in the in the episode uh, when I gave my initial thoughts. This is not a comic book movie. This is a crime noir. This is a dark crime noir drama, and they're using Batman as the vehicle to tell this story. If this was not Batman and this was just a dude playing a detective, right? This would be a damn good detective. Movie, mm-hmm. It would, right? It would. He didn't even need to have the title Batman. I think just having the title Batman prompt guys like you and I to rush and get early ticket sales. You know. What yeah. I'm saying? But the story itself, it could have been vengeance. It could have been the name of it could have been vengeance. Yeah. And it would have still been a great it's story. A great story. And so I love the fact that you get this shot of basically Gotham Square, which is basically Times Square downtown, with all these all the neon lights. It's lit up, but it still looks so damn dark so damn dirty like the city is cursed like and it's raining but somehow or another nothing is coming clean still yeah. right and then you get to these uh like the subway and these corners and the steps of the church where the dude is uh doing the graffiti and it says broke and this that, and the other and everything no matter how well lit it is it is still so very dark 
this crime, that crime noir, that dark feeling, all that is Batman the animated series. That is Batman the animated series, and uh, the second uh, Michael Keaton run is Batman, where every corner it just looks like no matter how far you get down the corner, it's always dark. No matter how many lights, there's still all this shadow. Like this city just cannot come into the light, no matter what it does. Even at the end of this film. When he's standing on the top of the building, and he's helping pull people out of the flood and into the arms of these helicopters flying into safety. And he says, I have to be more than Avengers. I have to be hope. It's even when the sun is coming up over the city, it still looks so yeah, goddamn it was, dark. It was overcast. It was overcast. I'm like, what is going on? And I realized and it was pollution in Gotham. Yeah, I was like, I was like, this city is just so beaten down. Right so across broken, the river from so, Metropolis. Yeah, so corrupted. And and that and, and that's the part that really boggles the mind. And when you really think about it, it's right supposed supposed to be right across the city. One way across a river is Bloodhaven, which is its sister city, not Metropolis. And then right across the other way to the river is Metropolis. Metropolis is almost always in the sun. Yeah, it's t- uh, exact opposite. This is the exact opposite. And it's like, yeah, this is how Gotham should look. Not just in this movie. Every movie going forward, Gotham needs to look like this. This has raised the bar on how the city looks. I was so impressed by the cinematography. When I say it's, it, it literally pays attention to all the other movies, right? The courthouse steps and inside the church, that's reminiscent of uh, the Schumacher era of movies, the ones with uh, Freeze and Riddler and Two-Face played by Tommy Lee Jones. Um, all the way back to Michael Keaton with uh, the, the alleyways and the subway and everything looking dark, no matter which way you turn, the hustle and bustle of the street. When he's like, when he's in the beginning doing the monologue about he's been out here two years and nights and I've turned into a nocturnal creature, I've basically become the creature I emulate, which is the bat. Um, he doesn't want to be in the light. I love that line. Um, everything that's a throwback to the Michael Keaton movies. The when you get him inside the cave and Alfred is talking to him before he gives him the cufflinks and he's looking on the computer and this, that, and the other, that's set up with the big, tall, giant computer, right? And then everything is spread out like this and it's just a bunch of this mishmash of tools you don't know what they do but obviously bruce wayne knows what they do it's a garage yes it's basically a garage even though he's inside a subway terminal that's right out of batman animated series they literally took every set they can possibly find out of every other version of batman mm-hmm. that has resonated yeah, with everybody even, um, and threw it into this movie even, what was that the, that uh, is such a great goddamn attention to detail the uh, the the movie with the, the christopher nolan movie with uh heath ledger uh, the scene where Batman confronted Joker in the interrogation room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were they not in pretty much that same they interrogation know, room? Him, yeah, it's the exact same. Then the exact same thing. Talking through the glass. Yeah. Well, well, no, I'm not, not. I'm not talking when he when he when he met with Riddler. I'm talking about when Batman didn't want to cooperate. Oh, when he was Gordon. talking to Gordon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is exact same. same the exact same one. That's what I'm saying. It's like it, this attention to detail and them bringing all these other sets into this and saying, hey. We aren't those movies, but we understand that you love those movies. And even if you don't like everything about them, they're still a part of the myth. And we enjoyed those movies as much as you did. Here's something from that movie. Here's something from this. Here's something from those animated series. I'm like, nobody notices like all this shit. I understand people are enjoying it, but I'm such a fucking nerd for movies and shit like that. I'm like, God damn it. I was like, God damn it, Matt Reeves, you have fucking <laughs> stepped it up. This is now yeah, the bar. <laughs> this is now the bar for Batman. You can't go below this. Uh, people people are still going to say that uh, Nolan set the bar, uh, you know, because he, he, I mean, come on, critics love the Nolan series, especially the one with Heath Ledger. I mean, it, it was just, you know, uh, my hat off to Heath Ledger for his portrayal as uh, Crown Prince of Crime. Uh, Crown Prince of Crime. He did a fantastic job, but um, you know, this is still a, a, a baby project. This project, this Batman, is still in its infancy, and it has a lot. It has a lot to grow. You know, it's going to do a lot of growing, and I'm just looking forward to seeing what uh, Matt Reeves is going to do because if he continues to move in the direction he's moving in right now, not yeah. only is this setting the bar, but he's going to raise the bar. It's going to be really hard yeah, to see, keep I'm, up with him. I'm, this. I'm, I was trying to figure out, do I actually want to say this? And I think I do with you saying that. I think this is it. Mm-hmm. This is better than the Nolan film. One film is better than the Nolan trilogy. Not because the Nolan trilogy was bad, Mm -hmm. but there is just a level of intensity, a level of attention to detail 
that has never been seen in any iteration of Batman outside of Batman animated series. So you can't compare the two. Because when no, you have time no to, because when you have the time to tell a series, you have time to do yeah. more things. A lot more things. Man, yeah. bat. Yeah, yeah. Bunch of stuff. Yeah. You know? But here you have a three-hour movie. It's, it's, it's three hours, and it don't seem like three hours. But here you have a three-hour series that has outdone, outclassed, <laughs> outstepped three movies from one director, two movies from another director, another three from another. God damn. Look, I laugh because Pattinson went from playing a Batman to the Batman. Batman. <laughs> right. He played a Batman to the Batman. I like, like, like look, Christ I, Almighty. I look, I, I want to say that this movie was, you know, um, set the bar. I would like to say that. Because as far as like the action, you know, uh, the, 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 the scenes, everything in this. The, the, Batmobile. Oh. I, I the, need to find out what car yo, that was. That they, I, I that want to say this movie is great, but you said it before we even went and seen the movie. In order to pull off a good Batman movie, you have to be able to capture the essence of Bruce Wayne. But we've spoken about this. This movie was not about Bruce Wayne. This movie was not about Bruce Wayne. This is why it's called The Batman. This was movie was about the Batman trying to solve a crime. In the beginning, he tells you, I don't care mm -hmm. about my family's legacy. I don't care about my name. I just want to stop this killer. Mm -hmm. Okay? So going forward, we need to really test Patton, Pattinson's acting. Well, I know he can act. I mean, Water for Elephants was a great movie. I, yeah. I love it. Uh, but we need to see Bruce Wayne show up. When Bruce Wayne shows up, then I'm going to say to myself, this movie is better or this movie is not as good. I need to see Bruce Wayne. I need to see that charming philanthropist billionaire playboy, you know, who's so carefree and reckless with his money that there's no way in any universe that this guy is Batman. So that means you have to introduce Lucas Fox. I think we seen Lucius Fox. That was a I don't know if it was Lucius Fox, but that was a black guy in the background. He was hanging real close to Gordon. I'm like, is that Lucius Fox? They didn't really show his outfit, so I don't know if he was a cop. Or just, you know, just a black man they threw in there for, you know. For uh, color sake. For, for color commentary, right? Um, I don't. Oh, yeah. Hold because on. you can't you can't really have him being Bruce Wayne without Lucius Fox. Because even the animated series tells you that while he's out there being Bruce Wayne, there's somebody helping him take care of the car. Yeah, you need a there's team. A, there's somebody out there taking care of making gadgets who introduces you know, people into the circle like, hey, mm -hmm. I know Batman wouldn't hang around this dude, but Bruce Wayne needs to hang around this guy. You mm -hmm. may be able to glean information that may help you later on. I mean, because uh, Batman is, Batman's going to be who he is. That's mm -hmm. one thing. That, you know, you can't take that away from him. But everybody knows in order to be successful, you need a good team behind you. You can't just go out there on your own and say, I'm going to be successful on my own. Because like he said before, I can't be everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, you need a good team. You need Gordon. You need Barbara Gordon. You need uh, Tim Drake or Dick Grayson. You need uh, Damon Wayans. You, you need an Alfred uh, uh, Pennyworth. You need um, um, Lucius Fox. You need Selena Kyle. You need a team. Mm -hmm. Without your team, you don't have Batman. You know, you get this one role guy who's out there got to shoot venom in his leg to keep surviving. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, you know what I'm saying, you just get a pathetic figure out there trying to solve crimes on his own. He can't solve crimes without the help of Jim Gordon. Mm -hmm. You know, which Jeffrey Wright, I, I, I love Jeffrey Wright and a lot of things that he's done. He was the man in Hunger Games. I really loved him. But I didn't think he made such a, a, a great Gordon. And, and, and possibly, this is, this is possibly why I say this, because this movie truly only focused on a handful of characters. Mm -hmm. Now, while Gordon did pop up multiple times, his role was not as significant as uh, John Turturro's role or uh, Colin Farrell's role or um, um, so, uh, Zoe Kravitz. Right. He had a smaller role, so he didn't really get to really shine. Because, like, at the end of the movie, when he saves the mayor's life, that was really all you seen of him. That was, that was it. That was his I'm last saving I'm, grace. I'm glad he's... I understand what you're saying that he played basically the background, but yeah, I, he's the background character. But I think 
the ver this version of Jim Gordon, not because it's Jeffrey Wright, but I think this, I would say this era version of Jim Gordon, he's not, he still doesn't have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he still doesn't have that, I'm not going to say edge, I want to say he doesn't have that self-awareness to where he's willing to be the guy out front. Because even, so, go back to... No, no, ben McKenzie had that. That's the one thing about, I loved about Gotham. I love Ben McKenzie. Yeah, but see, here's the thing, though. Everybody likes the Nolan movies. Jim Gordon wasn't out front. Jim Gordon took charge once he became... Yeah, but... He was. He went from... But that was also he Gary Oldman. Co- yeah, but see, that that's what I'm saying. Gary Oldman. I think... I, that's what I'm saying. I think Jeffrey Wright is channeling Gary Oldman in this case. Mm. He went... He's... In that era, he's in that space where at the beginning of him being at Gary Oldman being uh, Jim Gordon, he's um, he's the guy sipping the coffee and this dude and his partner is getting the bribe money literally right there in front of him. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, what's the matter, yeah. Jim? You don't want to taste? He was like, nah, man, I ain't, I ain't about that. <laughs> he he's he's playing the background, right? Yeah. And they was like, hey, man, you know, people, you don't take a taste, and people start to thinking he's like, you gonna snitch on him? He's like. The fuck I'm gonna tell. He's like everybody's getting it but me. Who am I gonna tell on? It was like nobody. Everybody's getting paid except me. I like I ain't got nobody to tell. This is the space that Jeffrey Wright is in. So you he can't be the one you think that he ought to be. He has to. He's in the similar headspace that Robert Pattinson's Bruce Wayne is in. Mm. I have nobody to go to. I'm not really worried. I'm just worried about getting through the day. I don't particularly give give a shit about this version of me versus this other version of me. The only version of Jeffrey Wright's um, Jim Gordon that he's worried about is the one that's keeping the wolves at bay from going after Batman because he understands that this guy may be weird. This guy may be a vigilante. Yeah, he said, uh, you're the only person I trust and I don't even know your name. name. <laughs> I don't even right? know. He's like, he's like, you're the only guy I can trust because you are doing just like me. You understand yeah. that everybody is crooked to some level. And, and Batman told him the same thing when he said that uh, um, that the killer's not after you because you're not corrupt. And that's the point. These two guys are literally in the same headspace. So I think this version of Jim Gordon, he should be in the background until, like, because remember, Gary Oldman goes from, his version of Jim Gordon goes from street cop to lieutenant to Commissioner Gordon in the span of two movies. So here we are at the beginning again with Jeffrey Wright playing Jim Gordon. We should see him go from he, now he's lieutenant right now, which is somewhere in between, you know, street cop and, you know, the, the top guy. He's kind of in the middle. So I think if if what we believe is correct and they do a trilogy of movies, Matt Reeves has proven he should at least get another movie. Mm, at least. I should I would say by the end, if they do a trilogy, by the end of the second movie, he's commissioner. Like and then you, like get, do something. then you get him out front. I mean, think about it. This version of Jim Gordon has the bat signal in a hidden location, right? Yeah. Everybody hates Batman except him. He understands that you all hate him because he's a vigilante. When really, let's be for real, he, you all hate him because he makes y'all look bad. He's doing your job. Tell me two things. One thing, one, one scene you loved about the movie and another scene you didn't like about the movie. One thing I liked about the movie, a scene that I didn't like about the movie. Mm-hmm. One scene okay. you loved and one scene you didn't like. One much. scene I loved, one scene I didn't like. One scene I absolutely loved, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, inside the church, here's the, uh, I think that was the DA, right? The one he had strapped the bomb to and he was asking the questions. He had to answer the questions in order to deactivate the bomb. Winds up, that third question is like, okay, so who who's the rat? Who's the guy that you're protecting at, at the head of this all? He wouldn't he refuses to answer the question. That whole scene, right, is just him answering the Riddler's questions. He gets to that last one, and, and he's like, don't want to answer. Pattinson is Batman says, um, who's the guy you're protecting? This cop has the wherewithal to snap right back to protecting himself and says, that's not the question he asked me, right? Because the Riddler, I mean, the, the Riddler asked him a question, but it isn't specifically who the guy was. The Riddler asked him, well, are you protecting the, the rat? Not who are you protecting? He says, are you one of the guys protecting the rat? And Batman says, well, who, are the, who is the guy you're protecting? And he's like, that's not the question you asked. That's not the question that was asked. 
right? He even even told you how much it was, how much he would take as a bribe, ten thousand dollars, yeah. right? He didn't told you everything, but I'm not gonna tell you who I'm protecting. I'm no, why? Because that guy is not just gonna kill me. He's he, gonna kill my whole family. He's gonna kill everybody I know. So if nothing else, I'll die here. At least my family is protected. Mm-hmm. I like that scene because they wrote that knowing, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, this guy can't live. Regardless of how, you know, what goes down in the movie, this guy can't live, but this guy still has to, he still has to have this air of, I will take this to my grave, regardless of what way I go out. Not me getting old in the bed. Whether me getting shot on the street doing my job or by some dude in the in the courthouse with and then other. If I gotta be detonated right here in the middle of this church, I'm still not telling you. My life on the line, I'm still not telling you because this is not about me anymore. This is about people that I am attached to. This is about everybody. I'm not about to put them at danger. That's a moral dilemma that has never been shown in any Batman movie. I love that scene because that you have to sit there and think that scene through to write it down. And to then to pass it off to get somebody to pull off the acting. Love that fucking scene. It is very understated. It is not a scene that most people would jump to and say they love. Most people would probably say, oh, I love the Batmobile jumping through the fire, you know, and landing <laughs> and him chasing him down and flipping his car. Most people would probably say some shit like that. <laughs> okay. um, I just I just love that scene. That scene was just very understated, very good. Um, a scene that I absolutely hated. A scene that you hated. Something hated. in that movie that just irked you, got under your skin. It had to be at least one thing in that movie that you just said, mm, no. I understand it's comic book lore. The one scene that I hated, and it's it's actually part of the whole uh, myth of this particular movie. Martha Kent being the child of a mother who kills her father and then uh, turns the gun on herself or whatever, and then she goes in and out of mental institutions. Remember, this is, the realist says this. She has a history of being in and out of mental institutions even after she gets married to Thomas Wayne. If this is supposed to be grounded in reality, are you telling me here's an orphan who's being raised by other people in her family in and out of mental institutions? Everybody in her social circle is going to know that. This is not a secret that can be kept. Mm -hmm. Period. Rich people don't keep secrets like this. It gets out. Right? Especially in Gotham where Part of the storyline that th- that this movie is taken from, all these people are part of the Court of Owls, right? Everybody knows everything about everybody. These rich folks are elbow to elbow. Nothing gets by them. They control everything. They're part of the underworld and the overworld. Mm-hmm. Falcon, Falcon, Maroni. everybody. Yep. Everybody is answering to them whether they know it or not, mm-hmm. right? Even the Waynes are part of this. So you're telling me that she's been in and out of mental institutions after mom kills dad and and kills herself but Thomas Wayne still gets to marry her right which is how explain to me how they let that rock how they pass that how they pass that off it's like mm, no I understand that's in the comic book that's one of the comic book storylines maybe not main continuity but it's in the it's in the storyline it's in the comic book but even in the comic books it always it always it always rang so very, you know, so very thin. There's no way in the world Thomas Wayne would have married. They would his his family would have allowed him yeah. to marry Martha Arkham. Not even, for love. Not even, Not for, even love. for love. I understand that both their families have a vastly a shitload of money. Because remember, he gives a billion with a B. A billion for the renewal fund. Yeah, as he, he donated that. He donated that. Like he's like, oh, I just write a check for that. That's cool. How much money you got? <laughs> you just throwing out a billion, cuz. So right, so I like at that part. I was like, eh, it's not much. I didn't. It's not. It's only I didn't hate nothing about the movie, mm-hmm. but that part bugged me. I was like, that just don't sound right. Even in the comic book, when I read it, I was like, that doesn't. That I like that's hollow, bro. They would not have let him marry her if she's been in and out of mental institutions, right? Right. Because rich folks are very protective yeah, of very their knit. bloodline. They're, they're very, very tight. Very they would have found somebody else. To, you know, because they they. You try to do the uh, mar- uh, arranged marriage. Arranged marriage. It, it would have definitely would not arrange um, Thomas mm-hmm. to, to marry a psychopath. Not at all. So I was like, man, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm just going to let it ride because it's not the comic book and I'm not about to argue with people about it. At least it's comic book accurate, right? right. Really, can't nobody argue with it. It ain't not the comic book. That's comic book accurate. Just if you don't like it, be mad at yourself. So yeah, those two, the, 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 I did, like I said, I didn't 
particularly hate nothing about the movie. I didn't hate that. It, it, just like in the comic book when I read it, I was like, eh, that don't seem right, but whatever. I'll just let it go. All I know is y'all got married, y'all had Bruce, and y'all got whacked in the alley. So, right, it's, it is what it is. Um, right. so, so what did you... I, I same got, question, you answered. Right, so check this out. What I loved about the movie, what I hated about the movie, there was two, two, um, two things I loved, two things I hate. I'm going to keep it brief. The first thing I loved about the movie was when the car came jumping up through <laughs> the phone. Everybody loves that shit. Yo, I mean, I'm not hating on it. Exciting. It was so exciting. But it wasn't even just the car jumping up through the fire. It was actually when the when the penguin rolled over and then Robert Pattinson comes, comes walking up. up. Yeah, he and, just and, leans and the, down. The, the frame was inverted. It was upside down. And he, yeah, and he leans down. And he's like, you don't know if he's looking or if he's not looking. And all of a sudden, the camera pans on his eyeball. And he's like looking right at you. I'm like, oh, that's, it was just a chills up my spine. Yo, loved it. Um, then uh, one of the other parts I love, and I would have to mention this, otherwise my wife would actually kill me. When he was on top of the police station and the stoop blew up, and he jumped off. Oh, the squirrel suit? <laughs> yeah. The flying squirrel suit? But it was such, because he's such a new Batman, he's new at this, it, his life was in mortal danger. He crashed and burned. <laughs> and he boy. crashed so hard. And he rolled. It just was so terrible. And he got up and he limped away. I said, that that scene was just so awesome. But doesn't, it, but and, and I would have said that if, if the whole, you know, the whole understated scene in the, in the uh, church wasn't, wasn't better for me. But that kind of speaks to the whole movie, and this is why I was like, his version of Bruce Wayne is perfect. It it fits the narrative of the story. It's he he's so new to everything, mm. he doesn't know nothing. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> he is so green at uh, yeah. at even the tools that he's you. using. He's so damn green. Let he doesn't know how listen. to rightfully use. So them. I listened to the podcast, and like I told you before, I did not see the image of him and Zoe Kravitz on the red carpet until you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of your podcast, I stopped the podcast. I went, I Googled the image of Robert Pattinson with, hey. uh, with Zoe Kravitz on his red carpet. And I seen this suit he was wearing and it was like two sizes too big for him. It was like ruffled at the, the pants, the, 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 the leg, okay? The, uh, the, the, the hands, or the arms of the, of the suit were coming way past his knuckle. It looked like around his neck, if he would have caught a good gust of wind, he'd he was floated gone. away. I mean, it was just a terrible looking suit. So then I go back to the podcast, and the first thing I hear you say is that he looked like he put on his father's suit. I just started rolling. Now, I said it to say this. After watching the movie, I go back and I look at that same image, and I be damn, it fit him. <laughs> the suit fits. <laughs> It, it fit the Bruce Wayne character. It was odd. The suit fit the character. I said, this is crazy. That was just the oddest thing. Um, but, okay, back to what I hated. I hated two things about the movie. One, how quickly the police seemed to forget that he stuck Jim Gordon in the jaw and ran out the back door. Because the next scene you see, he's just like walking through the crowd with uh, Falcone like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they, did they forget he a fugitive? Yeah. And then, and then um, well, past that, because, I mean, that, that was just one of those things that's just like, okay, I don't know how they forgot he was a fugitive. But the scene of the movie that really just irks me and it irks me to this this point right here, right now, um, uh, Jay, Jamie Lawson, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the lady that played the mayor, the, the black lady that played, yeah, 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 played yeah. Uh, uh, Bella, Bella Real. Yeah. She gets shot. Oh, okay. I know exactly what you're about to say. Go ahead. She exactly gets about shot say. at the end of the movie. The movie. Yep. I mean, her life was on the on the edge. She's bleeding out. Not and then, oh my God, there was another thing I didn't like. Well, there was so many things at, at the, the end of this movie that just bothered me. Like uh, why Batman didn't use his batarang to chop the cable and said he got to jump and grab it and cut it and look all... Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> let me get back to the point. So, um... The scaffolding falls in on the survivors in this flood. Mm -hmm. And Batman goes down there, and apparently no one's strong enough to get the scaffolding off these people. So Batman comes over there, and he lifts the scaffolding off. And Starts he pulling extends his hands out, and people start coming out. Okay, now, this mayor, uh, Bella Real, who has been shot and mortally wounded, now all of a sudden she shows no signs of agony, no signs that she's been shot at all. She's just treading through the water. And I said, well, whatever, where's, where's Where'd her you acting? Get shot at? 
Yeah, where, where's you? Where's your acting go? You're supposed to be shot, mortally wounded. He need to be carrying you out of here. Yeah, but instead, it's not like she got. It's not like she got shot in the leg. She literally falls back and grabs her side. Yeah, like a like her abdomen. She was messed up. And because Jim had, she couldn't get up and walk because Jim had to pull her. Had to back, drag her out of there. Right. So she just walked out of there through the water like and, nothing. Ever not happened. even that she walked out through the water. She's giving the speech at the end on top of the on top of the arena. I saw that and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. Suspend just, I'm gonna, just I'm let, let it that, go. that little bit. I'm just gonna let go. I'm gonna let it was a flesh wound. Uh, yeah, I just, maybe, maybe they, maybe she jumped out of the way. It looked like she jumped out of the way. Maybe she kind of leaned out of the way, or the dude missed, whatever. <laughs> but whatever, whatever. Like it's one of them things it's, I saw. It was, I was a like, clean yeah, wound. Yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> okay. I was like, ah, it, it could. Okay. The movie couldn't have been perfect. I mean, well, there's no, no perfect movie. movie, movie we perfect. I've never seen a movie that was perfect. No. You know, I've seen movies that were damn good. And I've seen movies that were damn terrible. Uh, this movie was a damn good movie. movie yeah, it was it, it was great, but it was it perfect. No, I mean it's it's got some flaws, but like I said, it's it's still in its infancy. You know, it's it's still got a little bit of growing up to do, and I'm looking forward to um uh, Reeves uh, sophomore um sophomore project yeah. with the Batman. So the the only thing about the movie that I didn't I didn't like, or should, I'm not gonna say I didn't like it, but the one thing about it that irked me was there was a lot. Of unnecessary exposition. There was a lot of unnecessary talking, the talking between characters. I'm not saying that the exposition was bad. Mm. It was well written. I'm not saying that it didn't help in some way. It was just a whole lot of it that if you took it out, it wouldn't detract from the movie. No. Then the movie didn't need to be just shot three hours. It probably would have been like two hours and fifteen minutes. So you know, you know. But, so, but I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm not going to shit on the movie for it. I'm, I'm, especially as a guy who's a writer. I enjoy exposition, but overall, it was like, hey, we don't need to have this conversation. We don't need to have this conversation. Just keep the movie going. It was too, I would say it was It was too much of it to the point that it was chopping the pacing of the movie yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, it was. There was this part in the movie where Selena Kyle pulls out her phone, mm -hmm. and it's a, a recording of her friend's untimely death. And it was just a lot of talking, just like, uh, my eyes start getting heavy and next thing I know my wife is shrugging me like wait up <laughs> because it was just unnecessary talking but then I go and see the movie a second time mm -hmm. and then I listen to that conversation of that woman on the phone and although it may have been long and really did chop up the pacing of the movie it was intense Yeah, it was brutal that what was, happened on the phone that was I didn't, fall, I didn't start to nod off I didn't nod off at all during either sitting but the one part that really dragged me was the the whole conversation with Paul Dano with the Riller at the end when they they got him in Arkham. I thought it was too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was nothing wrong with it, but I thought I was like, you probably could have took two or three minutes out of that, and it was, still would have been fine. Um, but yeah, that sequence where there where she's listening to Annika get killed, and then I, what was it, Gordon? He's like, oh God, he's 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 strangling the poor girl. Mm -hmm. and he, but they're still listening to it. I was like, woo. And this is, goes back to what we both said earlier. There has never been this much brutality in a Batman movie. Ever. <laughs> Nothing even close. La Actually, the animated series was more brutal than any of the other movies. But it still wasn't as brutal as this. This movie was wow. Yeah, the movie did it. Yeah, man, there was so much brutality in this movie. And I, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it 100%. <laughs> like I said on the last episode, this is a 9 out of a 10 movie with me. Uh, it isn't perfect by no stretch of the imagination. There are flaws to it but they're minute flaws that i can overlook right they're, yeah, they're, they're small flaws that i can be like eh. more joe chill please i want more joe <laughs> chill no more joe chill I'm, I'm i was i was happy you pointed it out and i'm okay with joe chill but i don't want no more joe chill uh i mean on the hell if you're gonna add somebody to the movie who would they add to the movie that i could that i could get behind that i could that i would I was like, yeah, it, it would make them up. Probably Lucius Fox. That'd probably be the only person they can add. I'm I want like, to see Dick Grayson. Come on. Not so soon, though. I, I want to see Dick Grayson. I tell you what. They could bring Dick Grayson in, but have it as the Flying Grayson. Just have a poster up say the Flying Grayson's Gotham Arena. The, the You know, the circus has come to town. The amazing Flying Grayson. Yeah. I mean, and show him on the poster with he, his parents. He doesn't have to be Robert. He can, they can literally get killed at the end of the movie. Yeah, and then, and then he... Then you know, like, oh, hey, hey, yeah, all right. we know what's going to happen. Know, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that'd be cool. I mean, like, like, we talked about that before. You don't actually have to stick a character into a movie. If you elude to him hard enough, just like, okay, that's enough. That's cool. That's like, I don't have to see him. That right there was enough. 
<laughs> I'll roll with that. That's right. You acknowledge them. I know you acknowledge them. Good job. Move on to the next. Yeah, we can do something like that. I'll, I'll take that. Let, let's, yeah. let's get the penguin, maybe Firefly. Let's get Two Face in there. Well, Firefly that, is going to be in Batgirl. It's going to be in Batgirl. I know. But hey, I'm know. looking forward to that because Brendan Fraser, they they showed a video of him. Uh, somebody asked him, hey, they uh, he was doing you know press for Batgirl and him playing Firefly, and uh, somebody asked him, he's like he's like, what do you think of all the the um, the outpouring of love? It's like now that you're you're basically back in the limelight after such long layoff. Even after Doom Patrol, he was still kind of on the outside looking in, and Doom Patrol was DC. Um, he's like, now you're basically back in the limelight, and people have been waiting for you to come back. He's like, what do you think about it? He goes to start talking, he can't talk. He's so choked up about it. I'm glad he's back, man. That shit. Yeah. Hollywood is a piece of shit machine sometimes, and they, they did him so, so dirty. But I'm glad he's back. Um, I'm, I can't wait for this next movie. Um, like I said, not perfect. Nine out of ten. I would I, I might go see this a third time. Yeah, I'm, I gotta go see it again. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm going to to pay to go see it because there's so many different movies that's coming out. And you know me, I'm at the theater almost every other week. But um, yo, yo, definitely, it it is definitely on my list of things that I need to watch do at you, least one time. Do you think after, after everything's said and done, it does Spider Man No Way Home money? Because no. right now it's it's like I said, it's like three fifty, three sixty. Something, and I know before the weekend is over, it'll be over 400 mil, which puts it over a bunch of other movies. Yeah, like Eternals is 402 million. It's, as it's, much as everybody wanted to dog the movie out, this, it was a good, it was a good, decent movie. It's 402 million. This is by no far a flop. This is gonna blow past that. Mm -hmm. But is it gonna do 1.86 billion? No, no, because everybody. I mean, as as good as this movie is, it's missing. It's missing one element that Marvel has capitalize on and that is the alternate universe you know what i'm saying if this movie did that if this movie bought in uh uh, uh michael keaton and it brought in uh who else uh christian bale let's just leave it at them too right <laughs> if it brought in michael keaton and christian bale then yeah i could see this doing numbers like that but that's the one thing that you, that you, no way home just crushed it yeah. bringing in uh many people were moved by uh, Gar Garfield, Garfield, I said it. Garfield, Andrew Garfield made me cry. Garfield, Garfield killed it. I have to admit it. Garfield killed it, but it was McGuire that made me want to see the movie. I love McGuire. I, I love too. Bully Spider Man. I, I love Bully too. Spider Man. And is those though that movie right there? No, I don't think the Batman is going to reach that number. No. Okay, so the next movie down. As far as money wise, uh, pandemic era is um, uh, uh, 007, No Time to Die. I still ain't watched it. That's 775 million. Yeah, still not watched it. Was, I, I have not made it past the point where he was at the, the grave site. By far, by far, that is Daniel Craig's best outing as James Bond. By far. So if you haven't seen it, please do yourself a favor and watch it. I'm still in the middle of a peacemaker right now. Uh, Freedom! Uh, oh, no, bro, look. <laughs> Oh my God! I talked about Peacemaker. If if you haven't heard that episode, go back a few episodes. Um, it's called uh, the name of the episode was what uh, Peace in a Peace in a weird kind of way or something like that. Uh, Peacemaker was I like something uh, else. Uh, a whole new world. Yeah, I, uh, I tell you what the best part of Peacemaker was. Side note from from the whole Batman talk. The best part of Peacemaker was the music in that show. Yeah, the music was excellent. The music in that show and that opening sequence. <laughs> The dance that is by far the best opening sequence I've ever seen. What is James Gunn? James Gunn got a real problem. He got a problem. Now, now tell me, am I wrong? He got a problem. When you get done with that series, <laughs> when you get done with that series, I want you to honestly look me in the face and tell me I'm wrong. Peacemaker is Guardians of the Galaxy for DC. Hmm. It's a a guy who's basically a villain because he's a bad guy, right? Which Star Lord is a he's a rogue. He's a villain. Yeah. He's a thief. He's a pirate. He's a pirate. Who winds up with a team, not of his choosing, the Guardians, and this team he's in, and Peacemaker's in with the series, basically trying to rewrite who they are. And they go on an arc where they change their entire outlook and change who they are for the better. Yeah. And they both fall in love with the girl on the team who's completely cold on the outside, but still, you know, still likes him too. Tell me that that ain't, that ain't Guardians of the Galaxy. That's Guardians. Because everybody on Guardians of the Galaxy 
are villains. They're all villains from Rocket. Well, maybe not Groot. He's probably the only one that's not a villain. But uh, Gamora, Nebula, Drax. They're they're all no. The only one who's probably not a not a villain. Groot's a he's a he's a bounty hunter just like Rocket. He's a, he's basically yeah. on the out. On the when, when you first meet him, he's a, he's a yeah. bounty hunter. The only person who winds up in the, in the Guardians that's not technically a villain is Mantis. Mantis. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, she's the only one. She's the only one that's not a villain. And Mantis in in Peacemaker is uh, at a bio. Yeah, that James Gunn really went over to DC and was like, I, I, <laughs> I know what I know what y'all like because I've done it already. We about to do it with this, and nobody saw it coming. Peacemaker is just Guardians of the Galaxy, but with DC characters. That's all it is, and I'm not mad because that shit is fantastic. Yo, Peacemaker. So I wasn't watching it. And you put me up on it, and now I can't wait to go home and finish watching another episode. <laughs> Ash, please. <laughs> I'm going to watch, watch another it. episode right now. Please watch it. All right. Freedom! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. I want to thank everybody. Will, thank you very much. Yes, I know it was kind of last minute I asked you to come and do this with me, and I appreciate yeah. it, man. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the wolf pack is always here, man. Yeah, all you know, the time. We roll like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait for uh, just the next thing, man. Please come back, like always. Uh, you know, you 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 don't even have to say, "Hey, do you want me?" Just just say, "Hey, I saw this. Did you see it?" Yeah. All right. Cool. We're gonna talk about it. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> the, I the vault is always open. Yo, I'm still waiting to do that Howard the Duck episode. <laughs> oh God, I totally forgot about the Howard the Duck episode. We'll get we'll we'll get to that. That that'll come up. We're because we do need to do that. We do need to recast Howard the Duck so they can make the movie for it. Yo, uh, your so, ideal for Howard the Duck. I'm telling you, somebody need to pick your brain. We're going to get to that. But your yeah. idea for Howard the Duck, what? I'm telling you, it's going to be good. Look, I'm so, leave it at that. So, yeah. So, until next time, I am Jake Alexander. You know, this is Will. Uh, please tune in again for the next episode. And we get out of here the same way we do every episode. God bless. I love you. And peace. Mm-hmm.